Welcome to the second panel. <coughs> Please uh, be seated. Um, this second panel is on privacy. Privacy is um, quintessential in a, d in a democratic state. So the, it didn't surprise me at all that the first panel discussed privacy and that the second panel will discuss democracy. This is the way it goes. It is very, this is the uh, challenge to uh, disentangle issues, privacy, democracy. They're uh, intimately linked. My name is Paul De Heurt. I'm um, very honored to be here as a moderator. I will try to do as good as my colleague before. I'm a Brussels and Holland-based professor. I organize myself a privacy conference in Brussels at the end of January, and the Council of Europe will also be there, uh, very visible, and I'm very proud of having the Council of Europe uh, at this Brussels conference uh, where uh, data protection um, law reform will be discussed. Now for today we have a panel on privacy. What I, noted, uh, what I noticed in my years of experience is that privacy lawyers become lawyers in regulation. So often the discussion is not about your, the values but about how to regulate around these values. And I think the same will be uh, uh, witnessed, we can witness the same here in the second panel. We have actually a bunch of very interesting people from all kinds of stakeholder fora, politicians, representatives, uh, NGOs, um, executives, and you will hear um, them all presenting initiatives where, um, uh, that are very precious to them. And you will also hear s small differences with regard to the regulatory consequences of, of um, these initiatives. And so the idea of this panel was to um, give everybody five minutes to present him or herself in French or in English, then make, a <coughs> make the relevant point, and then afterwards we will have first an internal debate between the members, and I'm sure we will have a good debate followed by a, a public debate and a Twitter debate. Thank you. And the idea is to follow the list of speakers in the program, so the word is to Andreas. Please go ahead. You'll, you'll be the first. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good thing about technology, yeah? it leaves traces. <laughs> okay, thank you, Paul. Um, my name is Andreas Krisch, I'm from European Digital Rights, which is the <coughs> umbrella organization of 28 uh, data protection and human rights organizations in, from 18 different countries in Europe, where Europe means the area of the Council of Europe, so not only the European Union. And uh, we have been founded in 2002 to uh, commonly address uh, the topics that uh, we think are important uh, in terms of digital rights, in terms of the development of the information society. And uh, so data protection, privacy is of course one of our, of our main uh, topics that, that we work on. Uh, what, what standards do we want uh, for, for data protection privacy for the future? We are in a situation where we have in the European Union a data protection uh, directive that was made in, in 1995. Uh, so we have uh, now the process of, of uh, evaluating and, and uh, renewing this, uh, this directive to, to see where, where we are. Uh, same initiatives are going on at the OECD and in, in the Council of Europe, of course, that's why we are here. And uh, so the question is, what changed in the, in the time since 1995, let's say, or in the last 10, 15, 20 years in data processing and therefore in data protection and, and uh, privacy? I think that also we, we did not know the internet in 1995, uh, still the, the, the concepts of, uh, or not at least not in a, in a large scale as, as today, uh, still the concepts that are in our data protection uh, regulations, the principles, they are still valid, I think, because uh, they are, most of them, uh, technology neutral. And what is changing is, is the amount of data that is processed, is the, the kind of how we process data. It's, it's completely different from the mainframe computers that we, that we have uh, several years ago. Uh, we are now uh, talking about the Internet of Things. This is a uh, topic that is, uh, 
uh, discussed very, very detailed uh, at the EU level, for example, in an expert group that I'm a member of. And uh, there we are talking about that, that things communicate with each other over the internet without human interaction, so completely autonomous data processing. <laughs> and I think this is the challenge to do this right, to find the right rules on how to, to do these uh, things in a way that is uh, data protection friendly, privacy friendly, and uh, therefore to, to find a way to, to enable those technologies while respecting the fundamental rights of the individuals. So the principles remain valid. Uh, the challenges are not fundamentally modified, but of course we need to address uh, some gaps that we already, uh, already experienced today and that we experienced in the last, last 15 years. So I think one of the main issues that needs to be addressed is to increase compliance with data protection regulation. Uh, keywords like privacy by design, privacy by default, we heard them several hundred times at conferences, wherever. Uh, but what we need is to get these concepts into practice. We need to get technicians that implement this into technology. We need to, to have uh, technology built according to, the, to these requirements. We need to, to embed it in our technology uh, to enable these technologies to become autonomous, to do their good uh, things in uh, communication over the internet without our interaction, but therefore we need to have this protection built into the systems, and then that is one of the, of the main points, I think. Uh, therefore, we should uh, think about making privacy, data protection, and security impact assessments before we introduce technology. So every time we, we plan uh, IT systems, we, we should do an assessment on what is this doing to the uh, fundamental rights of the individuals that are confronted with this technology. And uh, in terms of increasing compliance, I also think that we need to, to think about ways on how we can uh, get information on data protection into uh, the, the organizations that are acting in uh, data processing. So uh, one way could be to, to introduce uh, data protection officers uh, that assist the technologies on how to build systems in a, in a data protection compliant way. That, uh, assist the management of, of companies and, and other organizations uh, to behave in a privacy and data protection friendly way. Uh, so this would be enablers uh, and not a burden in my view and this is also I think a, a competitive advantage that uh, companies could have to do the things right from the beginning and not have to, to change the way they are doing things uh, afterwards. Can I? Uh, yes. Um, so I, if I understand you well, we need standards that meet, meet the new technologies that are used today. And um, for that, you, you want a whole series of new ideas to be implemented. Uh, privacy by design, privacy officers, um, um, and other techniques that uh, in, enlarge compliance. Mm -hmm. and, and also better enforcement, which would be my, my last point. Uh, I think we see a very fragmented, uh, fragmented situation on, on data protection enforcement and we need really to, to harmonize this situation to, to get data protection authorities uh, that have uh, equal rights. So today data, this data protection has, has these rights and other data protection has, uh, uh, authority has other rights. So we need to, to have uh, equal rights to data protection authorities and they need to be able to actually enforce data protection uh, obligations and uh, therefore to, to uh, support and, and to, to help data protection to, to be uh, recognized in practice. And uh, therefore also data breach notifications should be mandatory and uh, of course we need a better harmonization of the standards. We need to be able to communicate, and communicate with each other uh, over the borders. Uh, we, we can't have isolated data protection or communication, but this also means that we, that we need an, an enforcement system that is act, able to act cross border. So it shouldn't be a, a challenge to, to enforce data protection in a different country when I'm using a service here in Austria. So that would be. Okay, it. thank you. Uh, je passe la parole à Catherine Pozzo di Borgo, qui va nous expliquer ce que le Conseil de l'Europe a sur son ag agenda législatif. Et uh, voilà. 
Merci. Donc, euh, je suis Catherine Pozzoli Borgo. Je suis euh, vice-présidente euh, du comité consultatif de la Convention 108. Sorry, I started in French. Uh, so I just wanted to tell you I will speak French because I was offered the opportunity of the translation, and I thought it would be a good idea for you know multilingual internet. So, <laughs> sorry for that. Um, donc, um, je vais vous présenter. Uh, euh, les travaux qui sont réalisés actuellement au sein du Conseil euh, de l'Europe. Euh, comme vous le savez tous, le Conseil de l'Europe a remis sur la table euh, la Convention 108 pour s'assurer que ces principes étaient encore conformes euh, aux évolutions technologiques actuelles et surtout pour assurer un, un consensus le plus large possible sur la définition de nouveaux principes et de nouvelles normes en matière de protection des données. Donc, brièvement, euh, les résultats de la consultation publique que le Conseil de l'Europe a lancée en janvier dernier ont montré déjà un point important, c'est qu'il y a un consensus général de tous les, tous les participants sur la nécessité euh, de réaffirmer avec force les points forts de la Convention 108 euh, et qui sont essentiellement son caractère général, simple et technologiquement neutre euh, ces éléments ont permis à la Convention 108 de s'adapter depuis plus de 30 ans dans plus de 40 pays à toutes les évolutions technologiques et a permis que les principes soient déclinés à travers un, un, de nombreuses recommandations dans des secteurs aussi variés que la police, la santé, le profilage, les assurances. Le deuxième point sur lequel euh, la consultation publique a insisté, c'est sur le caractère conjoint, ouvert et contraignant au niveau international de la Convention 108. Alors, vous le savez certainement, la Convention 108, dès le départ, n'était pas un texte purement européen. C'est un texte qui a été élaboré avec l'aide de, de pays extérieurs à l'Europe, tels que les USA, le Canada ou le Japon, c'est un texte qui est ouvert à la ratification à des pays extérieurs à l'Europe et très récemment l'Uruguay a ratifié ce texte. Donc ce sont là des éléments importants euh, quand on parle d'Internet et de normes juridiques. Enfin, le troisième point essentiel de la Convention, c'est qu'il fonctionne sur un comité qui, dès le départ, est multilatéral et international. Donc ce comité euh, dont je fais partie euh, regroupe à la fois les représentants des États, les autorités de protection des données et aussi des observateurs de la société civile et professionnelle. Et nous avons parmi les observateurs notamment la Chambre de commerce internationale qui contribue activement à la modernisation des principes de la Convention 108. Ça n'empêche que le Conseil de l'Europe doit mener une réflexion stratégique sur le devenir de ce comité et sur le renforcement de ses pouvoirs de manière à pouvoir assurer un suivi et une application de la Convention par tous les États qui l'ont ratifiée. Maintenant, si l'on en vient au, à la modernisation des principes de la Convention euh, eux-mêmes, euh, on ne peut pas encore définir la ligne de conduite euh, du comité parce que les débats sont encore en cours actuellement. Mais on note d'ores et déjà, là aussi, un consensus sur la nécessité de maintenir les principes de la Convention 108 euh, tels qu'ils sont définis actuellement, quitte à les moderniser, voire à, la, à les compléter. Euh, pour illustrer euh, les travaux qui sont en cours, je voudrais juste insister sur trois sujets qui sont importants dans nos débats. Euh, Faut-il créer un droit à contrôler ses propres données alors cette question est importante parce qu'elle nécessite, si ce principe est reconnu au niveau de la Convention, ceci nécessiterait que soient renforcés et définis avec précision les droits des personnes et leurs garanties, c'est-à-dire droit d'accès, droit à l'information délivrée par toutes les sociétés qui travaillent sur Internet et droit d'opposition. Le deuxième point qui est très débattu aussi au sein du groupe, c'est de savoir si des principes tels que le « privacy by design » et le « accountability » qui sont débattus à peu près dans toutes les enceintes doivent devenir des principes de la Convention. Est-ce que ce sont des principes qui peuvent s'intégrer dans un texte aussi général que la Convention 108 ou bien est-ce que pour appliquer ces principes, 
on ne doit pas plutôt reposer sur de l'autorégulation euh, par les entreprises. Enfin, le troisième point qui est très débattu, c'est euh, celui des flux transfrontières de données, euh, parce que je crois que tout le monde s'accorde à reconnaître actuellement que s'il y a un sujet dans lequel la réalité et les textes ne s'accordent pas, c'est bien ce sujet-là. Donc la Convention devra très certainement revoir ses principes en matière de flux transfrontières de données, sans abandonner toutefois la notion traditionnelle de protection adéquate. Alors pour alimenter les débats, je ne vous cache pas que la Chambre de commerce internationale a mis sur la table une proposition très intéressante qui prend en compte l'ouverture des nouvelles technologies et d'Internet, mais cette proposition reste vraiment à analyser et à expertiser parce qu'elle vise à abandonner l'idée habituelle des transferts de données d'un État à un autre, d'une juridiction à une autre, et elle repose plutôt sur la responsabilité des responsables de traitement qui mettront en œuvre ces flux de transferts de données. Donc je ne vous cache pas que c'est vraiment un changement de position très net et qui mérite qu'on l'approfondisse. Donc, comme vous le voyez, toutes ces questions sont encore ouvertes. Elles sont en débat au sein du comité conventionnel. Mais je crois que l'implication du Conseil de l'Europe dans la, la, la régulation et le monde de l'Internet est extrêmement sensible, à la fois dans le cadre de ces travaux et euh, dans le plan sur la gouvernance de l'Internet euh, qu'il entend mettre en œuvre pour les prochaines années. Euh, je dois dire que... Ce pour ce qui concerne la protection des données, le comité conventionnel est à l'écoute de toutes les propositions qui pourront être faites ici et qui seront relayées dans le cadre de la séance plénière qui aura lieu la semaine prochaine. Thank you very much. That was a, a, a very good overview, allowing a good debate afterwards, like keywords, auto-regulation or not, changing of paradigm. Of, we will come back on this. Several speakers were chosen to come back on this. Andrea Ritter, please. Um, Um, another representative of the Council of Europe, another uh, example of what the Council of Europe does and um, another example of regulating, you will discuss a recent recommendation. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'm coming naturally from Slovenia. I'm the member of the National Assembly in Slovenia and, and as that, I'm also the member of the Parliament Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. I'm the politician and my duty is now to listen to you and to put into the strategy in the Parliamentary Assembly the most important things, what the privacy on the internet, what standards do we need. Um, I saw in the material my report, the resolution 1843 and recommendation 1984 on the protection on privacy and personal data on the internet and online which was adopted in October, this October in the National Assembly. So I think, um, I didn't see it, so I think it's very, very important to explain in five minutes what is important in this recommendation and what are the principles in the protection of privacy and personal data and ICT environment and are in this recommendation. Um, The Assembly started clearly, uh, started, stated clearly that in democratic state governance by the rule of the law, cyberspaces must not be regarded as a space where laws does not apply. Only specific legislation and effective enforcement can sufficiently protect the right to protection of privacy and personal data as required by Article 17 of the UN Convention on Civil and Political Rights and Article 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights. The absence of globally accepted international legal standards on data protections leads to legal insecurity and to the need for national courts to fill this void on a case-by-case -case basis. This exposes individuals not only to an uh, unequal protection of their privacy rights, but it also actions difference and changing requirements for ICT companies and users globally, causing virtually unpredictable liabilities. So, if I really very, very shortly explain these uh, nine general principles. First, the protection of private life or privacy is a necessary element of human life and the human function of a democratic society. Where the privacy of the personal is violated, his or her human dignity, liberty, and security are at stake. Second, the right to protection of privacy and personal data is a fundamental human right. 
which imposes on states the obligation to provide an adequate legal framework for such protections against interference by public authorities as well as by private individuals and entities. And the third, everyone must be able to control the use of their personal data by others, including any accessing, collection, storage, disclosure, manipulation, exploitation, or other processing of personal data, with the exception of the technically necessary or lawful retention of ICT traffic data and localization data. The control of the use of personal data shall include the right to know and rectify one's own personal data and to have erased from ICT systems and networks all data which were provided without legal obligation. And the fourth, personal data may not be used by others unless the person has given or her prior consent, which requires an expression of consent in full knowledge about such as, such as use, namely the manifestation of a free, specific and informed will, and includes an automatic or tactic usage. Consent can be subsequently withdrawn at any time. Where consent has been withdrawn, personal data may not be used further. And the fifth, where personal data are to be used with the intention to exploit such data commercially, the person shall also be informed of the concrete commercial exploitation in advance. Where personal data may be used by others because individual constant or the public availability or otherwise anonymity data, the intention, accumulation, interconnection, personalization, and use of such accumulated data shall nevertheless require the constant of the person concerned. And the sixth, personal ICT system as well as ICT-based communications may not be accessed or manipulated if such action violates privacy or the secrecy of correspondence. Access and manipulation through cookies or other unauthorized uh, uh, automated devices violate privacy, in particular that where such automated access or manipulation serves other, especially commercial interests. And the seventh, higher protection should be effort to private images. Personal data of minors or persons with mental or psychological disabilities, personal ethnic data, personal medical, health or sexual data, personal biometric and genetic data, personal political, philosophical or religious data, personal financial data and other information forming part of the core area of private life. Higher protection should also be afforded to personal data related to court proceeding or the professional secrecy of lawyers, medical professionals and journalists. Such higher protection may be effectuated through self-regulatory, technically or legal means, ensuring due accountability in case of infringements of data protection of privacy. Periods should be speci specified beyond which such data shall no longer be kept or used. And the last two, public and private entities which collect, store, processes, or otherwise use personal data should be obligated to reduce the amount of such data to the absolute minimum necessary. Personal data should be deleted when they are outdated or unused or where the purpose of their collection has been met or not longer exists. The random collection and storage of personal data should be avoided. And the last, everyone should have an effective remit against an unlawful inferences with his or her right to protection of privacy and personal data before domestic courts. Mm -hmm. Voluntary arbitration and self-regulatory bodies as well as independent data protection authorities should complete the judges system in ensuring the effective protection of these rights. Public authorities and commercial companies should be encouraged to establish mechanisms for receiving and processing complaints against them by individuals alleging infringements of their right to data protection or privacy, as well as mechanism for ensuring internal compliance with the right to privacy and data protection. Unlawful infringements or privacy and data protection should be punishable by law. This is very shortly nine 
uh, stages in the recommendation, you can see, and I hope you will read it on our website of the Council of Europe, and I'm very glad that this conference will add in the future to the ministers which are responsible in every country for the preparing the strategy in, our, in their own countries and of course the strategy then in the Council of Europe which we, the national parliamentarians and the members. Thank you. Thank you for this presentation. This is short, eloquent, political language. Uh, some lawyers um, ask themselves how we will make that language concrete. But before we uh, call for more regulation, I want to pass the floor to Reiner from Germany, who uh, has a beautiful um, story to tell us about self-regulation and new technologies. Please. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm uh, from the German Ministry of Interior, and we are also dealing with uh, privacy issues. And um, when we ask the question, uh, privacy on the internet, uh, what standard do we want? I think most of us agree if we answer we want a high standard. Um, but we also want a high standard of other human rights, of freedom of expression and uh, right to information and uh, right to use your property and, and others. So the second point is if we are not talking about the relationship between the government and its citizens, if we talk about the private sector, and just the relationship of users to enterprises and users to users or enterprises to enterprises. I think these standards or these human rights, they have to be in the right balance. Um, we see it in other areas too, <clears throat> that um, there is no, I mean, apart from the human dignity, there's no uh, fundamental right or human right on the top. It's not privacy, it's not freedom of expression. You have to find a, a balance between them. And if so, if you have to find a balance, um, how do you find it? What mean do you use to find this balance? Is it just the law or are there other means? And um, I think the answer must be it depends. Um, we already have... That's a legal answer. Well, it's a legal answer, yeah. It's always, it's always the right one. Um, it depends. Um, because if, if, if it comes to privacy, we already have rules on privacy. On the European level, we have it on a higher level, on the level on the, on the Council of Europe and with the Convention, and then uh, we have it in the national law. And um, now it come, I come to my example. Um, what, what is the right mean for an appropriate standard on privacy? Um, the, story I'd, the, the story I'd like to tell is, uh, is about Germany last summer. It's uh, the debate on Google Street View. Um, it's already more or less forgotten or cold coffee or whatever you would like to say, but um, it was a highly emotional debate in Germany last year, uh, whether we need new legislation for services like Google Street View. And there was a proposal from uh, the Bundesrat, uh, it's the second chamber of our parliament, uh, which would, would like to add some new rules uh, within our national uh, data protection law. And the goal, one of them, was um, to implement a, a right to uh, objection against uh, publishing photos of the front of a house. And um, the proposal was discussed, and many people said in this debate, yeah, we want this right because this offers us a higher standard on privacy. But if we would have done that, uh, what does it mean? Um, who's owning the photo of a house? Who's owning this data? And to whom belongs this right to objection? Is it the, the, the owner of the house or is it the tenant or if it is an apartment building, is it uh, uh, the person who's living in apartment 10 or 12, and uh, what about uh, if uh, one uh, in, in apartment 12 says, no, um, I don't want to see my house on the internet, and there's another one uh, living in the ground floor, and he's running a magazine or a, a restaurant, he's saying, well, I'd like to publish my photo on Google Street View because then people can find my restaurant. And it's, uh, so um, to find this balance within the law is very, very complicated. And um, I think it's, it's nearly impossible to, uh, to draft legislation which covers all the situations you could imagine only on this case on, of uh, Google Street View. 
And so the, the solution we, we proposed was to initiate some kind of a safe regulation, uh, not only with Google, but also with Microsoft and some German enterprises, and um, to find a solution um, and to give people the, the right to object, but on a, on a different level. And um, our proposal from the government side was also to deal with these uh, different interests. So um, the answer we got, or, or the, the code of conduct, which was uh, um, um, well, written and uh, or, or, or which uh, was, was given by the, the, um, the enterprises was, um, they, they found an answer and they gave this right to objection as it was more or less uh, in, in the draft legislation. Um, but there was no balancing of different interests because they, the enterprise said, well, that's too complicated to us um, and uh, we, we, we cannot manage uh, with, with these uh, different situations. But um, they gave the right, of, uh, the, the, the right to objection and um, it was implemented. And now people argued and said, well, now we have some kind of soft law, we have some kind of self-regulation or code of conduct. Uh, uh, do we have now a lower standard or uh, is it weakening our law if we uh, have something like that? Um, and is it binding and is it effective? Um, well, I haven't, heard of, I haven't heard of any complaint that someone who, uh, who would like to have uh, his uh, house front uh, pixeled by Google or Microsoft that they didn't do it. So I think it was very effective uh, because there was no complaint and there was no need for a decision made by a court or, or a clearing house or anything else. So I think um, the argument that uh, self-regulation is not effective, it's not binding, uh, is false in this case. Then people argued, well, there were, there were some opinions of data protection authorities and they wanted to have some more points in this code of conduct. They wanted to have a prior uh, right to a objection or a prior dissent um, if, uh, if before uh, um, the, the house front is, is published uh, in, um, in, on a service like Google Street View. And say, well, this is, uh, all, uh, this is our standard and uh, this is the standard we uh, read in our national data protection law. And uh, the, the enterprises, they didn't follow this proposal and they said, well, we don't see any need for doing so and uh, there were some decision court, uh, some, some decisions of courts in Germany uh, which uh, went in the same direction. So they said, well, it's not really necessary. Um, there are two different opinions about how we interpret uh, the German law and uh, we have the courts on our side and so on. So, but then the political pressure and the pressure from the data protection authority was that high that they say, well, this is still a lower standard, so please, Microsoft, uh, who was next with this uh, service, um, um, give us this uh, prior uh, right to uh, objection. And Microsoft followed it. And they, th this was uh, celebrated as a victory of privacy by, by some uh, people in, in, in Germany. But what was the result? The result was that big companies like Google and Microsoft, they could implement some uh, procedure for dealing with these prior um, uh, ob ob objectives um, and, and they could deal with it. Um, but smaller businesses who couldn't do that, um, they, they closed their shop and uh, open source projects like uh, open uh, street maps, um, they can't deal with this um, because it's, uh, the, the, the procedure is too complicated and the bureaucratic um, um, <coughs> effort too high um, to, to deal with these things. So the result was that um, blaming the big ones like Microsoft and Google in this case had the effect that smaller businesses um, had no chance on the market. Uh, and uh, there was some kind of effect um, and, and, and some kind of balancing uh, uh, the, 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 the rights um, of, of others, uh, which you really don't think is, is always uh, good. Well, Rene, you make your last point, please? Yeah, and that, that's, that was my last point. Okay, uh, go so, um, The only thing I, I wanted to add is that we, that we still are focusing on this uh, self-regulation and that we are starting new initiatives uh, with the social networks and others. Wow, the point is well made and I think everybody by now already has uh, at least an urge to, to uh, 
to comment upon wh what has been said by these speakers. But Jonathan, you're next, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jonathan Weeks. I'm Intel's Deputy Director for Legal Affairs for the Europe, Middle East, and Africa region. Um, Intel is committed to the fundamental human right of privacy, and as such, I'm part of a global team at Intel that's engaged with policymakers around the world to promote legislation, regulation, and standards to develop trust in the use of technology. Intel, Intel's business thrives when people trust the technology they use because it causes them to go and use that technology in new ways, innovative ways. So we, you know, trust in technology is crucial to Intel. Um, I want to just thank the organizers for, for hosting this event and for allowing Intel to participate. Very quickly, last year, uh, Last week was a very important 40th birthday. Uh, it wasn't mine, unfortunately. That was uh, a few years ago. Uh, it was actually uh, on the 15th of November 1971 that Intel introduced the world's first commercially available microprocessor, the um, Intel 4004. And um, a lot of people point to that processor as sort of kicking off the digital revolution. Um, um, new scientists have, uh, have said, if I can quote them, that Today, there's no industry and no human endeavor that hasn't been touched by microprocessors or microcontrollers. And that revolution is showing no signs of slowing down. It's why we're all here today. Um, Intel estimates that by the end of 2015, there'll be more than 10 billion connected devices around the globe. And so whilst the extension of the computing continuum uh, and the associated increase in global flow of data uh, creates tremendous opportunities and uh, offers many exciting benefits. It also creates a lot of challenges, particularly from a privacy and security point of view. Um, so one of the first points I want to make is, is about stakeholder cooperation, because we believe that protecting privacy and security in this age of ubiquitous data and global data flows can only be done with a coordinated approach between uh, governments, uh, NGOs, and corporations. We call it, uh, Intel calls it the triangle of trust. And we place the data subject very much in the center of that triangle of trust. So I was quite pleased on this morning's panel to hear people reiterating the need to make sure that all uh, stakeholders were engaged in these discussions about the creation of global standards. Um, Europe obviously has been uh, and should continue to be a leader in the development of European uh, of, of, and global cooperation efforts. And the Council of Europe uh, with its strong association and many achievements in this, in this area should no, no doubt continue to play a leading role. One of the other things I wanted to point out is that, you know, I'm obviously representing uh, organizations, corporations here, and one of the problems for a corporation like Intel trying to operate a global privacy program is that we need to look towards an increasingly confusing uh, and non-harmonized patchwork of global legislation and regulations. Um, the different markets in which we operate all have different and divergent obligations, not all of which have any real corresponding benefit to the end user. Um, in many markets, uh, we'll be subject to very bureaucratic compliance procedures, which, uh, and Andreas touched upon this, were really designed for a very different digital world that we, to the one we live in now. They were designed for a world of mainframe computers where the processing was static and where data didn't flow around the world. It's a very different digital world now. Um, it's a world of connected devices and continuous data flows and continuous global data flows. So the current regime, or some of the current regimes that we, we operate in, tie up not only scarce resources within our organization, and we think those, org those resources could be um, better direct to, directed to building privacy within the organization, but uh, also tie up resources that regulators. Um, and we would like regulators to focus on, or be able to focus on more consistent enforcement uh, and more robust enforcement. So we believe that there is clearly, I mean, gross uh, understatement, there is a need for global standards in this area. The question is, what should serve as the model for those global standards? Um, we think it's important to recognize that we can't really point to one model that can serve as that global, uh, as that global standard because we're always going to have situations where the individual histories, cultural differences, religious differences, economic differences of different countries and regions will necessitate some variation in the way they approach these, uh, these uh, subjects. 
Um, however, we need to set the high standards, the privacy standards, some of which we've talked about today. And some of those principles are already enshrined. Again, I agree with Andreas on this, that you know, the Data Protection Directive, for example, the key principles in that directive are still valid today. They're flexible, they're technology neutral, and so they can be applied across a lot of different situations. So we think that there should be a focus on uh, advocating for privacy standards, whilst at the same time acknowledge, acknowledge that it's up to each company and region to decide on its own particular regulatory models uh, and given its own traditions. Um, so we welcome the proposal to modernize uh, Convention 108. We think that's a, a good proposal and we fully support it um, so that it can address some of the challenges posed by new technologies. Um, but at the same time, we would call upon the various international bodies that are currently looking at, at this idea of global standards to make sure they pull together uh, to develop one single global standard, that we're not going to have divergent standards operating in different regions or competing for, uh, for attention, as it were. Um, all sides of the triangle of trust, the civil society, industry and government, should come together and try to rally around a single set of global privacy standards. Okay. Um, we're committed to that goal and we look forward to the continued dialogue in that area. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. We will, of course, uh, come back to uh, the, what is building up here. Uh, the organizers have chosen two persons to, uh, to come up with, they, um, with, with cases taken out of reality to put, um, not as an intermezzo, but to make things a little bit, bit contextualized. So I first want to pass the floor to Max Schrems, a student with an interesting Facebook story to, uh, to, t to tell us. Go ahead. Um, a short introduction while I'm sitting here. Um, we are from a group, it's called Your Versus Facebook. Um, i just give you a brief overview of what we did. Um, I was writing um, a paper at my university in the US where a guest speaker from Facebook was there and there were guest speakers from other IT companies from the Silicon Valley and my feeling as I was the only European there and there were all the others were Americans, um, the approach was um, yeah, there are regulations in Europe, but we interpret them a little different, and if they find out that we don't stick to them, there's not really a penalty anyways. That was what I got in these classes. So um, I was set up and said, okay, let's write a paper about it. So we produced the 551st paper that found out that Facebook is not sticking to European laws. Um, but that was not the point where we stopped. The next thing we did is we found out that um, actually the Irish Data Protection is responsible for Facebook in Europe. And we filed 22 complaints there. And it was kind of a little test of, let's see what happens if you actually do that. Because everyone is discussing, um, if you discuss about privacy, one of the first things that come up is Facebook. Mm -hmm. And everyone is saying, hey, that's not okay what they're doing, but no one does anything. And that was our interesting um, outcome. Right now, the fight is about really basic things. Um, we're about, um, we think it's about 10, 20,000 people that made access requests. Richard Allen is gonna be able to give you the right number. <laughs> um, but that's kind of our um, number that we think um, people made access requests right now. None of them is getting any of the background data. They only get the p data they put up. I personally got the background data, so we know it's there, but that is some, something so basic as an access request that we're right now fighting in Ireland against Facebook, a huge company. Um, other things is transparency. Um, we, I really read through every little, so don't drop anything, Richard. <laughs> it's not that bad. <laughs> okay. Um, another thing we went through was transparency. Um, there is, of course, a privacy policy that everyone that is on Facebook has read, and it's about 12 pages long. I'm a law student, and I can still not tell you what Facebook is doing with my data. Um, in the not current, but the data protection um, directive they had before, it said the only sentence that actually con said what they're doing with our data there was they are providing an efficient, customized, and safe experience. Any gym could say the same se sentence. I mean, how should any customer ever know what they're consenting here? Um, other things is that in my data sets, there were huge amounts of deleted data in there. Um, something that's so basic that if someone pushes a delete button, the thing should be actually gone. It's not on Facebook. So we're talking about very super basic things here. Um, the, I was now um, going to a lot of media places, panels like here. And what I got from people is that a lot of them are afraid and they're losing trust on the internet. 
um, a big um, thing you get back is, oh, I better just log off Facebook. I don't touch it anymore. Like my mom is freaking out. She's in the 60s. She's like, oh my God, I never go on the internet anymore. Um, and that is a problem we're facing, that there is new technology that we all want to use, and that's good technology. I'm still on Facebook. I love social media. The problem is that there are some companies that are, um, in, especially in the case of social media, has a monopoly on it, pretty much. Um, all your friends are on this one website, and they are not sticking to most basic laws. Um, one of the reasons for that is, um, and one question I always get is, why doesn't anyone do anything? And I'm sitting there, I have no idea. It's like, I'm a 24-year-old student. Why does it take me to bring the Facebook case about? I mean, it's totally ridiculous if you think about it. And one of the reasons is that we don't have serious enforcement in Europe. We do have nice laws, but no one enforces them at all. Um, in the case of Facebook in Ireland, the only thing the Irish Data Protection Commission can do is issue an enforcement notice. That's a piece of paper saying to Facebook, dear Facebook, please stick to our laws if you don't, and only if you don't do it at that time then, you can um, face a fine of up to 100,000 euro. In Austria, it's just 20,000 euro. Mm -hmm. If you see the budget of Facebook, that's nothing. Um, the absurd thing about it is it's smarter for them to wait for, to have the enforcement notice than doing it right at the, at the beginning. I'm comparing this sometimes to a parking violation. If the officer, you park in the wrong spot and the officer comes to you and gives you a piece of paper saying, could you please move your car in the next one week and if you don't, you pay one euro fifty as a fine. That's kind of how we're, how we're actually doing it right now and that's a, a huge problem. And I see that a whole lot of times that we are discussing about digital forgetting, about all these things that are really important as well, but we're not really getting through the most basic things in this case. Okay, and that is um, the biggest message I got to bring about here. Yeah, okay. Um, the Republicans have Joe the plumber. We now have Max <laughs> the Facebook student. Uh, <laughs> um, last, uh, last speaker is not announced in the program. She's uh, actually swapping. Reagan. I'm Reagan McDonald. Yeah, I wanted <laughs> yeah, to say so Reagan oh, McDonald. I, I thought you were. <laughs> I have the data here. <laughs> okay, Reagan, you have the last say in this panel before we start a discussion. Um, um, yeah, so I'm Reagan McDonald. I'm with um, Access. We're an international NGO that promotes and advocates for access to the internet um, as a means to realize human rights. And it's really clear the role that ICT plays in our everyday life. I mean, it, it seems very 1995 to say that you surf the web uh, because the reality is we are the web. And I, I, I think it's become extremely clear that, that privacy is really the key element to enable users to express themselves and express and express their rights, freedom of opinion, of association. Um, so when we talk about standards, um, I really think they need to be informed by three things, um, awareness, consent, and control. And I think everyone has a role to play in, in, in realizing these aspects, um, governments, corporations, and the user. So I'll just say a few things about each one. Um, for awareness, users should know what information is being collected and how it's being used. This seems very basic, but if we think about data breaches, I also want to echo Andreas's point that data breach notification should be mandatory. Um, apart from just you know the moral issue of your fundamental right being violated, I think um, there's no need to really shut out the user. Uh, I mean, they're basically the one that would be able to determine how serious the breach is. Um, so when developing criteria for notification, I think it would be a key element to bring in the user, because in the end, it's their data. Um, consent, any personally identifiable inter um, information stored by an online service should require explicit and informed consent. Um, and Max was also mentioning the issue of, of, of terms of service agreements. And you know, users turn to the internet and they're kind of almost forced to agree with these terms of services that are drafted by private companies. They don't always include the kind of rights respecting language that we, we expect in, in democracies. So unfortunately, um, due to prevalent monopolies or dysfunctional markets, they're used to just accept the terms. And you shouldn't need a PhD or a law degree to be able to understand what you're being asked and what kind of rights you're giving away. Finally is the issue of um, control. Users should have as much control as possible. Um, 
and this has, they should know the ability to, to know what information is being collected about them and to have access to that. Um, I think also an issue is data portability. I think um, Google has been doing very good things with um, data portability. They have um, takeout data, or in Europe it might be more appropriate to call it takeaway data. <laughs> Um, and I, I think these are basic standards that should be really kind of implemented across the board. Um, and I think for the role of the Council of Europe and, and Europe in general, I think they're really setting a standard in terms of, of data protection. And it's very important that the Council of Europe takes a strong stance on, on protecting these rights. Because if you look at from an international perspective, I mean, the issue of anonymity was brought up by Daniel at, at, at OpenLeaks. Um, and in the, in the draft strategy paper, it's, it's only having to do with, with children. And I think the ideas of, of identity management and non anonymity and pseudonymity are really issues that we all deserve. <laughs> and um, especially when you move it into an international concept uh, in other regions, these issues are really a matter of life and death for many people. So it's very important that, that we at least explore the options of anonymity um, and, of course, ensure pseudonymity. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's really the role of the, the Council of Europe here is to, to play this strong role in ensuring these, these rights. OK, thank you. Uh, well, you touched on a sensitive issue here. Eh? What's the, uh, yeah. Is there a specific role of the Council of Europe next to the EU? And what I gather from some of the interventions, those who plead for higher standards, is that they're actually trying to invite the Council of Europe to adopt EU standards, the high standards, and so on. But where does that bring the Council of Europe as a world platform? Huh? Will it then not lose its attractiveness to other players? And um, I would like to invite um, the panel members to comment upon each other negatively or positively, <laughs> but that's, not a, that's a less of a requirement. And think about the possible role of the Council of Europe, especially with regard to what Reagan says, uh, clearly advocating um, an, uh, an intimate partnership between Council of Europe and the EU. That's what I got from this. Please. Um, let's start with the first speaker, Andreas. Thank you. With whom did you disagree most? And then... <laughs> <laughs> I would put it the, the, the other way around. Uh, to, to identify with whom I agree most, I would uh, definitely uh, uh, name uh, Max Schrems because I think he... Uh, described very well what the, what the problem is, especially with his 60-year-plus with his uh, old mother that is uh, now a some, some, uh, little bit afraid of the internet because it's so dangerous there. And I think this is one of the really main points. If we want to, to use this technology for business, if we want to use it for, for communication and so on, if we want our societies to rely on these technologies, on this mass communication, on our objects, on our products to communicate with each other, then one of the most basic things that we need is trust. And this trust will be the basis for all business models that will be based on this technology. And therefore, I think it's extremely important to get this right, and data protection is one of the main things that needs to be done right in order to uh, be able to provide this trust, in order to, to make people confident in the technology, and in order to, to uh, have them a good feeling with relying on these things. And now we've spent, I don't know, 20, 30 years on building these technologies, but now we are going the next step, and the next step is to utilize for these technologies for, for our uh, different purposes, be it business, be it private, be it communication, whatever. Okay. But the basis for this is trust, and this is what we need to achieve. And therefore, we need uh, ways on, on uh, how we give consent, for example, to data processing. What is the information that I need to get to decide if I'm okay with this, uh, with this kind of, uh, of, of uh, processing? Is it, am I really expected to read 40 pages of, of law speak uh, to, to then maybe understand what is going on? Or is there a requirement to keep this short, precise, and to the point, and easy to understand? Because I'm not going to read 40 pages of, of law speak, and nobody is going to do this. This is made for the lawyers and for the courts, for the courts but not for the people using these technologies. So yeah. that's the point. Rainer, you mentioned that your self-regulatory regulatory initiative would 
also is going to deal with social network sites. Would you do better than, um, is your alternative working here, considering Max story, Max Plumber? <laughs> well, as far as I understood him, he, he was not a complaining about the, the law that much. He nope. said it's about the enforcement of the law. Yeah. And um, I think self-regulation ca can make it more transparent how to find a common interpretation on the law first, and it offers new opportunities to enforce law and the standards uh, wi which are set uh, there in the law. But um, if it comes, for example, to social networks, it's not that easy because it's um, sometimes, even there, you have to find the right balance. Um, and I think uh, because you asked uh, for the role of the Council of Europe, um, what I really, uh, we, we appreciate uh, in the work of the Council of Europe is that they n are not only focusing on privacy but also on other human rights like freedom of expression and others. And so if there's a conflict between them, you have to solve this problem and this conflict. And that's a problem of the existing uh, European law on the, Europe, on the EU level. If you see the Lindquist uh, decision, uh, that we have strong rules on privacy in the data protection directive, um, but then uh, it's up to the member states to deal uh, with conflicts uh, coming up uh, because of the freedom of expression of individual persons. And I think that's very important if it comes, for example, to the right to be forgotten. Um, it's the same. Uh, I mean, I, if I think my data should be forgotten or deleted, it's a good idea, but what is my data? Is it an email I sent to a friend? Do I have a right to delete this email also in his folder on his account? Um, and if it comes to Facebook, if I send a message on Facebook, uh, is it a, well, it might be a slightly different to a, an email, but uh, should I have the right to delete my message also in the folder or the account uh, of the other person? So I think there you have some kind of, of, of the, the same conflict. and. I think the, the self-regulation and the code of conduct can deal with these problems um, more specific and more flexible. Okay. Catherine, you were saying yes. You were agreeing, which is forbidden, but nevertheless, go ahead. Je voulais aussi revenir à la question première, qui était le rôle du Conseil de l'Europe et de la Commission. Euh, simplement pour souligner que depuis le départ, euh, le, le, le texte de la Convention 108 est le, est le texte qui a inspiré au départ la directive 95-46 de la Commission européenne. Et que dans le cadre des travaux de modernisation euh, de la Convention 108, le Conseil de l'Europe et la Commission travaillent main dans la main. Parce qu'effectivement, au moment où tout le monde révise ces textes, euh, on ne peut pas aboutir à des choses qui divergent totalement. Donc ça, c'était pour répondre à, à cette question-là. Euh, sur l'autorégulation, effectivement, je trouvais l'exemple euh, donné par mon voisin très intéressant parce que et la France et l'Allemagne sont des pays de droit où on aime la loi et appliquer la loi. Et j'ai trouvé que dans ce cas-là, c'était quand même un exemple extrêmement pertinent euh, en, en matière de, de nouvelles technologies. Donc je crois qu'il est à prendre en compte, effectivement, comme on le disait au sein de la, Conven de la Convention 108 dans le, pour la modernisation, est-ce qu'on doit introduire de nouvelles de nouveaux, de nouveaux principes comme le privacy by design ou le accountability, ou bien est-ce que cela relève de l'autorégulation Et je crois que dans le domaine de l'Internet, euh, c'est une, une vraie question. Et que les, des, des solutions de ce genre doivent être recherchées. Ok, any more uh, I, I, I need you to uh, help me out. Huh? Yeah, please, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Iris Bialicevlajic. I'm coming from Personal Data Protection Agency in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and this is a very interesting topic for me. Uh, I'll, I'll just give a brief um, opinion on what has been said. Um, I think that when we talk about uh, Council of Europe and uh, EU, uh, I'm sticking with Catherine and with uh, those who think that Council of Europe uh, has main role, because it's for a with uh, it is better because it has more members and it's open for some uh, countries like Uruguay or maybe uh, Monaco or I don't know, um, Hong Kong one day, who are willing to take those um, uh, principles that are uh, being written in Convention uh, 108. Um, 
unfortunately, EU does have very good standards, and all the countries that are members of EU or want to become members of EU have harmonized their laws with uh, these um, with these standards. But somehow, the work of uh, Working Party Article 29 or some other subgroups is very uh, narrow, and it doesn't include everybody else. So when we're talking about this, I think that Council of Europe uh, is and should uh, be still the leading um, international forum for data protection. Okay. And that's what that's I said. Thank you. Um, there was this lady and then this, uh, sir, and then I see you. Um, you want to, uh, for the sake of, uh, yeah, well, ladies first. <laughs> Thank you. So um, who, who are you? Uh, I'm Divina Fromex. I'm a professor at uh, the Sorbonne University. Um, just about the Council of Europe, uh, I think, yes, it should be first because it's shown its uh, potential for generating law from the bottom up. Uh, and uh, we see that other countries and the Commission follows. So I think there is this capacity um, for the Council of Europe to generate trust across the board uh, basically, as a civil society activist myself, I'd rather trust the Council of Europe than uh, the Commission, having tested both. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think there's a role there, and, and, and there's, a, there's a sort of um, uh, exemplar uh, value in what the Council of Europe does, and it's very much watched by countries that are wanting to become democratic, especially the Latin American group. So I think it would have a snowballing effect that is quite important. But does the uh, Council focus on general principles, or does it need to play a leading avant-garde role with harsh, high standards? That's a bit of uh, debate. Uh, huh? That's where uh, the connection between the soft law and the hard law is at the moment the missing uh, link. Uh, I think we all agreed that it's better to start with soft law, but as Max and others have been saying, uh, what happens when there is no way of treating torts and damages? Yes, who, who do we call? I mean, who, yes, what, what do we claim on? Uh, who is going to eventually come down with the hard stick of a heavy fine or a, a heavy a posteriori requirement for uh, apology or whatever, other things that exist in other media. You know, this at the moment, there is no decision from there. And I would recommend that the Council of Europe make a few proposals and see how they fly with the, the, di the different groups they are, they are talking with. So we need something to bridge the soft law versus hard law. I think we are all in agreement that at the moment soft law is better because it doesn't constrain, because it leaves it to be generative, because we can test the un unintended consequences, but there's a moment where it breaks down. And so then who, what institution takes over? And I would argue that an international intergovernmental institution would be best because of the transnational border, uh, transnational uh, case and that we, we have here. And then the first point I want to make is last point. I, I really yeah. last point yes is uh, I have a feeling we have a, a, a dialogue of deaf people and dialogue de sourds huh? because we very well know that all the platforms that are generating the problem are American they are under American understanding of privacy and data and the American understanding is data is property it's sellable to any third possible party. And when I was at the EG8 uh, in June uh, last, I heard several people from the big corporations saying privacy is an obsolete concept that has lasted 25 years and was basically a commercial mistake that we will not allow to continue. So yes, you're right, Mac. If they, they can sign anything, they haven't actually, there's a sort of understanding between the EU and the US, but as long as the platforms are generated within American law and American protection, trust will not be around, at least for the Europeans. How can we as Europeans make the Americans understand that trust is also commercial value? I don't know. Yeah. Okay, the, the gentleman over there was first? No. Oh, there is a division of rules here. No, um, this gentleman was first, over there. Nigel Roberts from Guernsey. I'd like to react both to what Reiner and what Max has said. Um, in Reiner says that um, you're addressing the fundamental human rights between um, individuals <coughs> and individuals and individuals and companies. But the fact is that not only 
de facto, not only in practice, but in law, they don't exist. The convention is applied and addressed to the relationship between the state, the public authorities, and the government. The only exception to that is the positive obligation. The positive obligation of the state to provide an environment in which the rights are respected. The actual companies have no obligation whatsoever. In that case, it's all very well that Google is playing nice, but what about all the little organizations? Which brings me on to what Max said. It, it links directly. I happen to be the first person in the United Kingdom, possibly in Europe, but perhaps not, to obtain damages from a sender of unsolicited mail for the simple act of sending that unsolicited mail. A lot? A lot of damages? It was about uh, 400 euro. Oh, okay. For one mail, <laughs> it's not so bad. Um, <laughs> you would expect there would have been a flood of people doing the same thing. In fact, I know of about half a dozen in the UK. I'm not sure of any others. Um, so in answer to your question, what... Um, how does Facebook behave with your data? It's the same as the answer to the question, how does a large gorilla behave at a diplomatic reception? <laughs> Any way it damn well likes. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, gentlemen over there. <laughs> um, strong images. Yeah, we need those. Go ahead. Subtleties are also welcomed. Uh, <laughs> So Alexander Klimberg from the uh, Austrian Institute of International Affairs. As an mm -hmm. international cybersecurity expert, I'm always interested about internet governance and digital rights and their contribution to national legislation, European legislation. Very often there's a major disconnect. And listening to the conversation, I think it would be very helpful if the Council of Europe would be more engaged in the European legislative process or at least seek to advise on it. For instance, at the moment we have a directive on the protecting information systems against cyber attack that is currently under review and under debate within the European Parliament. And the original draft of this legislation actually only defined attacks on cyber information systems and, did not, and penalties and did not actually seek to impose any duty of care on the holders of data or on people who potentially could, could incur, uh, uh, could, could damage people if they are, don't uh, hold up this duty of care. And all public entities were taken had no responsibility to, to uh, citizens' data. So within this context, when we proposed modifications to this bill and, and suggested that it might be necessary to have a duty of care component in this and that companies and public entities might have a responsibility to protect their information under their care, uh, we were told by the, the presidency that this was anti-business. And the people who proposed this, uh, this bill was the European People's Party, which is not exactly an anti-business union. So given the level of debate that we've had here today on data protection, and on similar matters, wouldn't it be na nice to have this level of debate within the European Union and the European Parliament, and what are you going to do about informing those decision makers? Thank you. Um, Catherine, uh, vous voulez répondre à ça? Parce que... No. no. Um, Sorry. I think there was a speaker issue. <laughs> Je pense qu'effectivement, c'est peut-être plus une question pour le Parlement européen lui-même que pour le Conseil de l'Europe, ce problème de la responsabilité des hébergeurs, parce que je crois que c'est très débattu par ailleurs dans d'autres enceintes, notamment à l'OCDE, et euh, il me semble que ça relève plutôt de ce niveau-là que euh, du Conseil de l'Europe. Cela étant, je souhaiterais en profiter pour ré réagir à ce, ce qu'a dit Madame précédemment sur le rôle du Conseil de l'Europe. Effectivement, ça rejoint une des grandes questions que l'on a actuellement au sein du, du TPD, euh, où on, on sait bien que la Convention est un ensemble de grands principes très larges. Le TPD a toujours eu vocation à prendre des recommandations sectorielles sur différents sujets et à réagir à des problèmes d'actualité. La question qui se pose actuellement, c'est qu'il faut qu'on soit beaucoup plus réactif aux questions d'actualité, qu'elles viennent de l'Assemblée parlementaire ou d'autres endroits, et que par ailleurs, on ait des recommandations qui soient peut-être plus recentrées, plus efficaces, et peut-être qui relèvent plus de la hard law qu'elles ne le sont actuellement. Mais ça, tout ça est en train d'être débattu, effectivement, au sein du, du Conseil. OK, il y a une place pour plus de questions. Il n'y a pas de Twitter qui me stalking, donc allons à Twitter. Oui, yes, go ahead. Oui, merci beaucoup. Uh, Nigel Hickson, département de la Culture, Media et Sport UK. Juste deux brefs points. First of all, on the on the question of the Council and Europe and the European Commission, far be it from the UK to uh, champion the role of the European Commission. But uh, I, I, I do question uh, at the practicality level if the European Commission are 
are coming forward with a regulation, and we'll, we'll find out, of course, in, uh, in, in, in January. But the European Commission have done a lot of work on the revision of the, Euro of the uh, European Data Protection Directive. And if that comes out in the form of a, a regulation for some of that scope, as it might well do, then it would seem completely stupid for the Council of Europe to come out with something that contradicts that. Because, I mean, how could European countries buy into something at the Council of Europe if they're mandated to, uh, if, if they're subject to a regulation <laughs> at the European Commission? So I think, you know, there has to be a level of common sense involved here. Uh, the, the second uh, issue is trans-border data flow, which uh, I think has been addressed, but I, I, I think the panel perhaps could say a bit more on it, because the, again, there seems to be some sort of a contradiction here. Uh, uh, it's always the US that somehow get blamed uh, for everything, and uh, I'm not going to enter that, that debate. But actually, I don't particularly care about the US in this debate, but I do care about the developing world. And it's very funny, I would have thought, for the Council of Europe to come out with statements in terms of transborder data flow that would really deprive uh, both users of innovative services from the developing world and also would deprive the developing world of providing those innovative services for, for users in Europe. So I, I would like to see how, how we bridge that divide. It is simply not practical to apply the standards of data protection we apply in Europe to all countries. They don't have the legislative ability to apply those sort of standards. Now, of course, businesses in those countries have the obligation to safeguard data, but trying to apply European legislation across all 193 UN countries just seems bizarre. <coughs> okay, Jonathan, you want to react on that? Because I think the first point was about it makes, it would not be sensible, sensitive to distinguish between the EU and Council of Europe agenda. Is that your viewpoint too? Viewpoint too? Well, I mean, one of, the, one of the comments I ended my uh, introductory session with, with was, you know, call upon all the various international organizations that are involved in this area to make sure they, they, they cooperate uh, and we don't get a, a divergent group of, uh, of regulations and standards and, and what have you. So I do think that's important. I mean, I think the Council of Europe has an important role because, as, uh, as one lady mentioned earlier, it goes way beyond Europe. You know, and, and we need global standards. You know, this, this isn't something that's just a problem in Europe. We need global standards. So um, I, I think the Council of Europe definitely does have a, have a role. I, I just wanted to comment on uh, something on uh, the, the, the gentleman in the bow tie um, said, uh, and I understand you've got 400 euros, so you're buying all the drinks tonight. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I think it, it, it touches on a very good point here. We're talking about standards here, and, and, but we mustn't lose sight of the fact that is just one element of a, um, a, 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 a decent privacy regime, right? And um, we've talked about enforcement, robust and consistent enforcement is another very important element. And an element we mustn't lose sight of, and I think this relates to your, your comment, is data subject awareness, it, th so that people understand what their rights are. You know, we've seen a number of surveys, including uh, uh, surveys commissioned by the Commission, which just indicate how little data subjects understand what their rights are when it comes to data protection. They don't even know about data protection authorities existing in their countries. So there's clearly a problem there. And I think it, you know, these things are part of a jigsaw puzzle. You, you can't miss out a piece. You've got to have all those pieces to complete the picture. OK, Andreas, you, uh, you had an urge to say? Um, I also think there is, there is, of course, a role for the Council of Europe to play, and uh, we need to, yeah. to have uh, data protection not only in the European Union, but uh, to spread this uh, as, as far as possible. And therefore, I think one of the, one of the main points is to, to put the same uh, proactive uh, approach uh, to the Convention 108 as it was put to the Cybercrime Convention. We need to get as many countries into this as possible to, uh, to be able to, to build uh, technology that is uh, that can serve us in the future. We build the, the, the foundations for our future economies, and uh, therefore we need to, to lay these foundations, and we need to be very proactive with it. And I think that's the uh, a very, very big point that the Council of Europe should do and can do. And on the other hand, and this is already the, the, the last point again, uh, I think we needs to be very careful when we talk about balancing things. I need 
I think before we start balancing one right or one interest against another, we should first think very intensely about if we can't integrate those things. And especially with data protection, when it comes to, to, to shaping technology, there is often the possibility to, 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 to integrate data protection and security together into the technology instead of balancing one against the other and, and uh, lowering uh, the one for the, for the good purpose of the other. Thank you. I have a reaction here and then there. I also have a Twitter reaction. I'm very happy. I'm, I'm connected. <laughs> Twitter people. And the Twitter community would like to hear Richard Allen to respond, but um, <laughs> there's a free choice after me. But I'm first going to give the floor to this um, person. Hello, I'm Jeremy Zimmerman, um, spokesperson for La Quadrature du Net. I, I wouldn't want to be the, the gorilla in our <laughs> diplomatic uh, reception here, but... Uh, but... <laughs> on one hand, we all agree that massive amount of data have an economic value for companies who have an incentive to do business with them. We all agree that uh, it's very hard to make this company delete any of this data. And we all agree that um, security breach, uh, privacy breach can have dreadful consequences for uh, our fundamental rights. And on the other hand, we have this directive in the EU about data retention, where we force those companies to store data for an uh, extremely long period of time and is never evoked the possibility that this retented data can be breached as well and what would be the consequences. So I understand that when the, the directive was adopted, there was a matter of a balance between privacy and security in the wake of the, the terrorist attacks in, in the UK when UK had the presidency. Um, it is a serious issue and the, the the directive is about to be revised, and to my knowledge, there is no evidence that serious crime was tackled due to this data retention okay. that wouldn't have been solved by the standard technical retention that is done by operators, by targeted capture of data, and other regular type of enforcement. So my question here is, what would be the role of the Council in this regard and in the wake of the, the revision of the EU directive. Okay. I'm gonna pass the question to Andrea. You wanted to take the floor, but you have a specific question. You have nine strong points. Yeah. I don't think you can ever sell them to the Americans, or, uh, so they're very European. Uh, so you're actually forcing the Council of Europe to uh, focus more on its, not on its third members, but on uh, So this is a responsibility you're taking as a politician. <laughs> and then you don't say anything about this this uh, mistress <laughs> complained about that bad data, data retention directive of the EU. So uh, please. But you know, I'm a woman with uh -huh. a lot of experience as a politician, so I'm not afraid and I'm optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you very much for all the words about the Council of Europe and the trust. Me as a national uh, representative parliamentarian, I'm also very, very, I believe in the Council of Europe. Because of that, I'm active as a national parliamentarian in the Council of Europe. And the Council of Europe means 45 countries, not only 27. You should know. The, the Brussels, they are doing, of course, some very, very important thing. But the Council of Europe, we are discussing much more, um, what can I say, uh, in, in countries that they are not aware of what is the future and so on, so on, so on. So um, I'm also very pleased that we opened the question about the rights. Because for me, as a politician, it's very, very important who should define the rights in the future when we are talking about the, the privacy on the internet. Me, as a politician, as a member of the parliament, is very, very important because my obligation will be in the parliament when we will vote, when we will prepare the le uh, legislation. And I'm representative of the people, of course, and so and so and so on. So, um, when we are talking about uh, the data, I was on Facebook five years ago, two elections, but then, oh yes. my God, what I said before and before, I forgot because I didn't have time. So I said not, unfortunately, I will not uh, now anymore go on. But for me, it's very, very important. What is my archive? What I said, what it's on. So, and because I'm historian and I'm working in, with the heritage, Again, it's very, very important 
what is what will be where the storage is, what for what kind of information what can I find when I will be eight years and so on and so on. So when I'm talking about the relation between Council of Europe and uh, and Brussels, and we are in the connection, we are we are doing um, of course all the, the the legislation what they are doing in Brussels, we are discussing in the national parliament, in our representative, in the, our countries. And of course, I know I'm informed very well what is going on in the data protection, in the legislation about uh, media in the EU, because it's my daily work in my national parliament. So we are in a cooperation. And because of that, the Council of Europe is much more and more and more, because then I can discuss much broadly uh, the, 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 the positive and the negative, yeah. what they are doing in the Brussels. I get the feeling and that nobody likes Brussels, but uh, <laughs> I'm going <gonna, laughs> to ask uh, Richard to uh, uh, respond to uh, the Twitter community, and then the Mr. Uh, but first, Richard, uh, please. I always <coughs> respond to Twitter, even when I've been called a gorilla. Um, <laughs> uh, three uh, points, really. There's a lot we can say, but three points, really. One is, I've heard from the platform, actually, two examples, I think, of the system working rather well. I, I think it's... Uh, fantastic that an ordinary citizen of the EU like Max can go to the Data Protection Agency and the Data Protection Agency does carry out a, a serious and fundamental investigation of a company like ours and requires us to answer every single point he's raised with us. To me, that's the system working as it should work, that any citizen in the EU can exercise their rights through their Data Protection Agencies. And I also heard from Reiner Stenzel again about mapping companies having to come to the table uh, and figure things out. So the idea that uh, uh, companies that want to be around for a long time and have a serious reputation are somehow you know, uh, uh, not required to come to the table when data protection authorities in Europe make requests of them is, is not realistic. We do, we feel that pressure constantly. So one, I think the data protection commission system is actually better than has been painted. Uh, second point briefly is don't underestimate people power. Again, when you're running a service, uh, uh, people are very powerful. They do understand a lot of what goes on in our services, partly through reading the policies, which we do have a responsibility to make clearer over time, but also just by the use of the service. We get constant feedback on every aspect of our service because a lot of what you're doing on it is obvious as you're using it. Uh, so it doesn't just re we shouldn't just look at the policies. We should look at how people use services uh, and the feedback they give. Um, okay. And then the third uh, uh, point, just to say that there's a... Don't, don't be careful what you wish for. Don't throw up trade barriers. Again, Ryan Stencil talked about this with the mapping services, and, and Nigel mentioned it in terms of services from other parts of the world. The joy of the internet is a small group of people can get together, create a service, and reach a global audience. And the risk of some of the calls for regulation is that you raise barriers so high that what we effectively say is, until you've met those massive regulatory barriers, in other words, hired 200 lawyers, you can't launch your service on the internet. And that won't hurt people like us. It won't hurt the successful large companies. It really will hurt those, particularly in developing countries, yeah. who are starting new services. So it sounds like a plea to say regulate new companies less. And I think it is. Uh, but as they get bigger, you can have higher expectations of them in terms of yeah. regulatory requirements. OK, thank you. I'm, having, um, I'm getting orders for the lunch. Uh, you all deserve it. There's one uh, person having a right to a last question. And then the panel has a last say on everything that happened if they became a better person by listening to you and so on. I want these kind of emotional sharings. Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Wolfgang Benedek from University of Graz at the European Training and Research Center for Human Rights and Democracy. I have two points. One is about the issue of self-regulation. Uh, it is the American approach, so to say. Problem solved, we are satisfied. Uh, in Europe, uh, I think we have to go a bit deeper. Uh, if privacy is a human right, then we also have a human right to a remedy in according to the European Convention on Human Rights. And the Parliamentary Assembly in its uh, resolution declaration has actually also uh, taken that into account. They, they asked for a right to remedy. So if this is just self-regulation, this takes away from me this right to remedy. Because uh, what can I do? I mean, problem solved, finished. If there's a problem, then we can start the whole procedure again, but there's nothing for me. Uh, second point, uh, concept of privacy. We didn't discuss it at all. Uh, but I think it is worth discussing um, if we all share the same concept of privacy. 
My feeling is that sometimes younger people have a different concept. Uh, they're much more relaxed about it. So we need to create awareness, but to what point? I sometimes have the feeling that in the South or in the East, uh, in Asia, there's a different concept of privacy than in the UK. Uh, so this is also something where I think we need <coughs> to work for a kind of global understanding, if not global standard, because Facebook <coughs> and these other networks are globally operating. Uh, and this is also something which we should put attention to. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, dear panel, panel members, starting with Reagan, go ahead. You, uh, yeah. in a nutshell, uh, two a or nutshell. three uh, key phrases and, and then no pass problem. on. Um, I just want to say I do like Brussels <laughs> first. <laughs> um, <laughs> yay! Yeah. Okay. Um, but actually, just to pick up on, on, on what you were saying, um, in terms of standard setting, um, when you do come into the international concept, I, I mean, these concepts are different, and, and we didn't get to really get into, I guess, the, the nitty-gritty issues on privacy, but um, we would be here all day talking about that. Um, I think there are a lot of also misconceptions about privacy. I, again, I, I go back to the, the strategy paper. It, it, I don't think that's necessarily true, that younger generations uh, don't understand privacy and aren't conscious. I think there, there's a, a huge group of um, older people that are using the internet, and it's likely they also don't understand privacy and, and aren't very versed on these because they're not the digital natives. Um, and just to come back to that now famous gorilla <laughs> statement, um, and the EG8, and, and also the, the, you know, a few weeks ago, the, the CEO of LinkedIn who said that privacy is an old person issue. Um, I, I just don't think that's true, and I, th I think part of, part of this jigsaw is making sure that you know, and not underestimating the, the user. That, you know, it is shifting in this way, and, and the more that users know, the more empowered they are, then they will really make that decision in the end and, and, and choose, choose the right way. And just following with that, talking about, you know, over-regulating or, or how startups will, will conceive of this, you know, maybe giving them more room and then regulating after. I think, again, this is another issue of perception. I mean, the new startups now, the new Facebook, it's not Facebook, it's, it's diaspora. You know, it, it's, it's shifting. So I, I think this whole generation is actually changing into a, a place that they, they know about their data and, and they want to keep it that way. So I think we are talking about we don't know what's coming next or what's changing. And, and I th I'm really kind of hopeful about, about that aspect. OK, Jonathan, that was a strong message of hope. Yeah, you have the same? Just a couple of things. Um, I think we should avoid uh, reducing this discussion down to a US versus Europe yeah. uh, discussion. Right? It's not, it's not that simple. And there have been some very encouraging signs in the US just recently, um, uh, some initiatives that we certainly supported. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is just, again, to reiterate support for what the Council of Europe are doing in this space. You know, we think it's very important, and we think the Council of Europe has an important role to play in the discussion. Uh, and moving this forward. So. Okay, thank you. No. You wanna? Yeah, just um, my remark is thank you very much for that kind of conferences. I think we need places that we can be together. The people for the government, the parliamentarians, uh, the com the company, the owners, and the NGOs. We should talk about that because um, we, we, we didn't have time yeah. or we, we don't have space or place. We should open because because of the young generation. You're yeah. very correct. They are diaspora, but yeah. they understand. I think they understand Facebook. They are they are very very aware what the Facebook means. That it's what my daughter. She's 28. She's on Facebook for many years. Uh, we talked also through the Facebook and so on. So, so they <coughs> know exactly. And because of that, it's the responsibility of the young generation. Whatever the company, the government, and so on, our responsibility for the future, what we will do, and how we will prepare the legislation and the rights. And um, for me, thank you very much for uh, the conference, and I will be again and again and again the member of the Council of Europe, not as a parliamentarian, but as an expert also in the future, because I believe in the Council of Europe. Thank you. Okay, um, Andreas. Thank you. I would like to come back to the theory that data protection is a barrier to new small businesses. Uh, I strongly disagree with this uh, because I think this is a business opportunity. 
we see a very strong demand in the population to have data protection. And so it's a field of innovation for small and medium-sized enterprises to, to shape technology, to find new ways on how to deal with information. And this is an opportunity, especially for European businesses, maybe this is not a good, a, a good message for, for Facebook, uh, but there is a role to play, especially for small businesses, uh, to, to, to make a fortune out of data protection and of new ways uh, of, of processing data. Uh, the second thing I would uh, like to address is uh, that also governments and administrations have to play their role in data protection, in my view. Uh, this means that we first, Jeremy uh, just uh, mentioned the data retention directive, uh, that we need to evaluate all these legislation that has been introduced in to, uh, to, to facilitate uh, security. Uh, we need to see are these measures effective? And as with the data retention directive, uh, we clearly have seen, and uh, my organization uh, did an evaluation of this uh, parallel to the one of the European Commission, we clearly see that there is no evidence that this is necessary in a democratic society. So we need to also think about to take these measures back if they are not necessary in our societies. And this is one role for governments and of course for politicians, parliaments. Uh, the second role is that we also need to think about to include data protection as a requirement for public procurement, because with that we can uh, create a market for that. And we <coughs> firstly serve the purpose of enhancing data protection and on the second uh, hand uh, enhance the opportunities for our companies and for your local uh, companies in your countries to make an advantage out of data protection and uh, an advantage out of shaping technology in new ways. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Max, how okay. many points do you want to raise? I'm trying to make it as short as possible. Two feedbacks on, on Richard Allen. Um, I do understand that Facebook is clicking the like button on European legis legislation and enforcement because there's just not a whole lot there. So I totally see that you like that. Um, the other thing that obvious using you brought up if I click an X where it says delete and I click it, as a user I would say it should be deleted. Facebook told me no, it's just removed. Um, so I doubt that that is actually the case in, in this case. But in general, um, what I wanted to bring up um, is we do have a European market and I do think we have a European culture that might be in the privacy issue very different than in the US. I was studying there, um, I, a lot of my friends are in the US and I like the US a whole lot, but in this point there's just a different opinion. And I do not think that we can get one global privacy regulation. We should have one in Europe that is um, not so different in every country so that companies can actually stick to it because it doesn't make sense to have 45 different regulations because no one is ever going to be able to stick to them. So we need one central thing, but that's got to be enforced in the end. And I don't think you need 100 lawyers for that. We were sitting um, back home with a bottle of wine for a couple of nights and filed the complaints against you. So um, I don't think it's all too hard to stick to that. And that is the last thing. A lot of, um, of young people got back to us, and especially young people that are using these technologies and want to use it, but don't want to worry. And that's what um, politics got to gotta, um, take care of. Okay, thank you. Catherine? Just in conclusion, I would like to say that for 2-3 years in France, there was a real debate to know if privacy was a story of old imbeciles or if things had changed. I am aware, thanks to my neighbor, that privacy still exists, so it is rather reassuring. A point to raise has also drawn my attention. We have talked about it earlier, it's the question of auto-regulation. I am not certain that we should see the same thing as the question of auto-regulation. Je ne suis pas certaine qu'il faut y voir un moyen de faire disparaître les droits du citoyen, mais il est certain qu'il convient d'être extrêmement vigilant en la matière et que face à la, au développement des technologies et pour pouvoir être véritablement réactif et justement défendre les droits des citoyens, on a peut-être besoin de trouver d'autres solutions, alors ça ne sera peut-être pas l'autorégulation, pour pouvoir appliquer les principes notamment de la Convention 108. Donc je pense qu'il faut... Il y a un nouvel équilibre à trouver et bon, je ne sais pas encore où il est, c'est ce dont on parlait avec le hard law et soft law. Et puis pour ce qui est des États-Unis, je crois qu'actuellement ils ont un grand débat sur les smart grids. Et à l'occasion de ce débat en Californie, je crois qu'ils ont mis en place un, des, des grilles d'analyse de ce que pouvait être la privacy et la protection des données. 
Et je crois que ces grilles d'analyse pourraient être un élément très important à l'intérieur des discussions qui sont tenues au Conseil de l'Europe pour voir comment on peut justement moderniser notre approche et notre analyse de la protection des données. Okay, thank you. Very disciplined. Rainer. Just one, one brief remark to uh, what uh, Wolfgang Benedict uh, said about the self-regulation. Um, I made a clear distinction between the public sector and the private sector. So I'm not talking about self-regulation as kind of a, the government is regulating itself, giving itself rules and so on. That's, that's not my point. I'm just talking about the private sector. And um, what I couldn't uh, explain uh, explicitly was um, how uh, this uh, self-regulation should look like, but maybe we can have a bilateral talk about it, because I think there's not one model of self-regulation. There are different ones, and um, the, the self-regulation has to make sure that some uh, requirements are fulfilled. Uh, but we can talk about this uh, later. And on the discussion about uh, the Council of Europe and the European Union, uh, <laughs> I would only say that uh, it's always too good to compete uh, for finding the best solution on these things. And I think every uh, discussion is fruitful and uh, we have, uh, uh, and it's good that we have the Council of Europe and also good that we have the Commission and they both look uh, maybe in different ways uh, for a solution and then we would see uh, which is best. Thank you, thank you members of the panel. Thank you ladies and gentlemen for uh, having supported this. Um, just a good, round of applause and then we go to lunch. <laughs>